Thank you very much. Gentleman yields back his time. Distinguished gentlewoman from North Carolina, Ms. Green. Uh, Georgia, Ms. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. And gentlemen, I thank you for coming before the committee today and discussing this uh, very, very important issue, especially given that our government has the American people in over $31 trillion in debt. So we appreciate you helping track that down and where it goes. Um, since, since all the money has been spent on COVID, there's approximately over $400 billion missing which is extremely concerning to most Americans. Um, and I, I just want to talk for a brief second about how, how difficult it's been. Obviously, everyone knows this. Uh, the government shutting down our economy, shutting down businesses, um, paying people basically to stay home, the difficulties of it for employers to get their employees to come back to work, um, to, to start going again. And, uh, you know, here we have the GAO estimates that the total fraud and pandemic UI programs amounts to at least $60 billion. Uh, just, just a brief question for you, um, Mr. Turner. Were there any states that seemed to be particularly vulnerable to fraud and improper payments in their UI programs? Uh, we saw across the country uh, most states uh, exhibit the same uh, problems and challenges. Didn't really see, uh, so all of them I felt were vulnerable and there was vulnerability uh, that was displayed. What type of problems were there? Uh, again, the multi-state claims with stolen uh, identities was the, the number one problem, just multi-claims and, and people filing for numerous people to include deceased individuals, uh, prisoners, uh, suspicious email, multi-states. And has that been uh, uh, chasing down those those basically criminals? Has that been something that your your department has been uh, putting a lot of time to? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, from day one, and we've only just been able to scratch the surface. Uh, so that has been the biggest challenge for us. Approximately, how many um, uh, charges have you filed, or how many people have you oh, filed charges against? Twelve hundred indictments and six hundred charges. And just kind of let me give you an example of the scope of what we've been dealing with. Uh, you know, before, before uh, COVID, before the pandemic took place, we had maybe 100 uh, cases or complaints a year on UI fraud. Uh, since then, we've been getting 100 to 300 a week. Wow, that is, that's a considerable amount. Uh, th thank you for answering my question. Um, I'd like to ask about the do not pay system. I know you've been asked, you all been asked about this a good bit before. Uh, the Office of Management and Budget and the Treasury Department jointly maintain the do not pay system, uh, which is a free service that agencies can use to verify a recipient's eligibility for payment. Um, I'd just like to ask Mr. Del Mar, uh, uh, Mr. Turner had said uh, previously that some states don't use the do not pay system. Is that correct? And if so, why not? Um, I believe they are now uh, required to, uh, but that wasn't always the case. Uh, so I think the combination of uh, they've made improvements in their interface. It's, it's an easier system to use than it was. Uh, and the addition of the additional databases that uh, we talked about the death master file and a couple of others. And one point I was going to make is the current legislation allows a three-year use of the death master file for DNP. So that would go from the end of this year through the end of 26, roughly. Uh, I think there's, there's a proposal to make that a permanent uh, allowance. And I think that would uh, do a lot to make the system more effective in stopping multiple payments or ineligible payments. Right. There was seemed to be plenty of them, I think. Um, did all agencies involved in pandemic relief use the do not pay system? I don't think all did. Uh, I can get you more specific information and address your question, you know, with a lot more depth, uh, and we'll do follow up on that. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, the, the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee found 69,323 questionable Social Security numbers allegedly used to obtain $5.4 billion 
and COVID relief, according to a report. Um, Mr. Shoemaker, what do you know what happened to that money and was it ever recovered? Um, th it's a specific instance. No, I don't have don't know if that money was recovered. It would have been it, it could possibly be associated with with ongoing cases or cases in the past. That was a different type of a project. That was a data analytics project just to review. But what that report indicates is a very powerful resource, which is the Social Security Administration. Um, that data is not readily available to Office of Inspector General. It's not readily available to, to programs whenever they stand it up. So when we talk about the instances where, you, where an agency may not have used do not pay, the government has data available. If that data is made available, which, it, which we're, we're, in the, we're in the business of best evidence. Mm -hmm. If you're an auditor or you're an investigator and you're looking for the best evidence, you go to the source. Um, if that source data is available in the programs and in oversight, um, we, we certainly can unlock uh, the power of that data. Right. Uh, well, that's, that makes sense. Um, in October 2020, your office said that SBA's management continues to insist that it controls are robust despite overwhelming evidence. To the contrary, do you still agree with that assessment? Certainly that assessment at that time, and I believe that that, uh, that assessment has been proven true. Um, the, the over 700 indictments and 600 arrests um, is, is further proof that, that there is rampant fraud in the EIDL program. Thank you very much. I yield, I yield back my time.